Good morning, everyone, and welcome to episode 13, if you can believe it, lucky 13 of the Sandbox.Space weekly podcast, where we talk about all thing, all things video game industry. Um, I am your host, Chris. I am joined, as always, by Baby, who's in my lap, taking a little nappers, uh, and uh, Mr. Ross, the, the lawyer man of the video game world. How are you today, Ross? Well, Chris, thanks for having me back. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's always good to have you. We get to chat about a variety of things on this beautiful, I don't know what it's like in uh, Chicago, Illinois, but here in Columbus, it is raining. Uh, the cats and the dogs. Ah, yeah, we're definitely getting a little bit of uh, Misty Fool Spring this week. I never know if we're officially kicking off our spring season or if it's uh, just mm-hmm. another trick. Yeah, did you have a nice couple of days, the past couple of days? I think it was Sunday was beautiful. Sunday was in the 60s and was very sunny. And you always know when it's a good day in Chicago spring because everyone's outside because we, we've all been hiding from polar vortexes all winter. Mm-hmm. But we've, we've had a lot of rain this last week. So my, my husky Onyx was terrified of all the, the flashes and booms. So she was my thunder buddy this week. Mm. Yeah, yesterday was really, really uh, beautiful. I think it was like 70. Monday was really nice, too. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, but baby gets a little scared on thunderstorms. She doesn't, there's not much that bothers her, but, uh, thunderstorms kind of get to her, mm-hmm. um, not her favorite. All right. Well, are you ready to start this bad boy? Let's kick it off. Let's do it. Okay. So I want to, uh, first of all, grab something because, excuse me. Uh, oh man, I got too many windows open. What am I doing here? There we go. That's how we do it. And boom. Let's talk about GDEX for a second. So GDEX, the uh, Midwest's premier gaming expo, uh, is happening October uh, 24th through the 27th this year. Uh, The reason I'm bringing it up is because we just got our tickets uh, live. So uh, we have a spring sale going on where you can get discounts on tickets. If you click this little buy passes now button, it'll take you here to our store. Uh, here's a section that tells you all about the, um, spring sale. Here's where you can buy your passes. And then if you keep scrolling down, there's a bunch of pass info here that you can click. So if you want to know more about the passes, then, um, you can do that. So, uh, I just want to let everybody know. Also, we still have, um, exhibitor spaces though. I did a quick calculation this morning and we are more than half filled in less than two weeks of our artist market spaces and our ice spaces, which stands for independent student experimental. Those are our smaller tables for people that want to be involved in a a convention that maybe have never done one or don't feel like they can handle a full 10 by 10 booth or whatever, but we are more than halfway full on those. Uh, And so just if the past couple of weeks is any gauge, then uh, probably the next two or three weeks, we will be totally full on those. So if you are interested in doing that, make sure you apply for that. And then we also applied, or applied, we also uh, put our applications up for, um, let's see, I think we put that here, um, for speakers and whatnot. So um, if you want to speak or do an experience, um, we're still updating a couple things on the website, but um, yeah. Uh, And let's go ahead and turn this off so we can see our beautiful faces again. Uh, Ross has been a speaker for many, many years at the GDEX. Um, Absolutely. No, this is one of my favorite conventions going back uh, over 10, I think about 10 years at this point. But I was just plugging this event with my students the other day. So I think we have some hopeful aspiring game developers and innovators in the the tech industry going to come check out their first GDEX ever. Nice. Well, I am working on the hotels to get the hotel lock organized so hopefully that will be up uh if not this week maybe next week and then um uh yeah i I, we've got our discounted tickets so if they want to buy um their passes at a lower price if they want to pay the full price i'm not going to stop them but if they want to pay the lower price they can do that uh and then also on april 1st our volunteer applications will go live so those that want to volunteer 
and get free entrance into GDEX. Um, that is uh, also an avenue. Um, are you, I forget, are you doing GDC this year? GDC, I'm taking a pass this time around, and it, it is with a heavy heart that I am doing so. But even without being there in person, it's kind of hard to escape the vacuum that is GDC. All of my feeds, all of my messages, and I think every conversation I'm having with industry folks is all revolving around what's happening at GDC and what talks are happening there and how we're going to fix things, improve things, or just uh, you know come to grips with a new normal of 2024 in games around GDC. Yeah, so... Uh, GDC is the, one of the first things I want to kind of just chat about um, mm -hmm. from a sort of an open and honest conversation. I'm not throwing any shade. I think that GDC is amazing. And as someone who throws another game industry event, I think that we all can. Where are you going, babes? Where are you going? Rock, 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 rock. Um, we all should be helping and supporting each other and whatnot. But I've gotten the impression over the past couple of years that uh, GDC is kind of... I don't want to say stagnated because I think that might be too harsh of a word. Um, mm -hmm. But it seems like there's been a lot of talk about ways that GDC can improve or, um, you know, maybe things that need updating or changing. I don't know what the right word would be. So I was kind of curious on your thoughts and take on it. What do you your pulse on the uh, the industry? You know, E3 is gone. So GDC is really kind of the only big gaming event i mm -hmm. think in in the u.s i mean you still got gamescom you got paris games week you got a japanese or tokyo game show um but yeah am i on my off base on this or or what are you feeling I think a lot of folks are taking a, a more critical look at conventions generally and how effective they are because a lot of effort goes into uh, attending an event effectively, I'll say. So uh, th this has been a topic of conversation with a lot of my students of, is, you know, is going to a convention on the other side of the country when it's a lot of time and it's a lot of money and a lot of effort to do, is it worth it? You know, it, am I going to come home with a job? Am I going to come home with a new network? Uh, you know, am I going to come home with some new industry knowledge? And I think it's, uh, those questions are getting harder to answer for a lot of folks because I think it is getting more expensive. It's getting more exclusive and maybe there's not as much certainty about finding a job or finding mentorship or finding, uh, you know, all those things that used to come a little bit more easily with a trip to a convention like GDC maybe. So I don't know. I, what I've been seeing lately is especially post pandemic folks being less keen on going to in-person conventions uh, especially the larger ones. So your your PAXs, your GDCs, your South by Southwests. Um, you know, folks are trying to find a way around the the entire hornet's nest and you know effort of a large convention like that. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. And one of my you know as we develop GDEX and as we keep building it, I feel like there is um, there's a need, particularly in this region, to be able to offer a um, uh, not a replacement for GDC, but maybe an augment to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the reality is, like, GDC is expensive. If you want a full pass, it's like $2,400 for, like, mm -hmm. the week, which is, like, crazy expensive. Plus, you have to travel there. Plus, it's in San Francisco. So mm -hmm. you're not going to walk out of there. If you decided just you're a normal person off the street, you're buying a pass, you're going to fly in, you're going to have $800 or so in travel expenses, then you're spending two to $400 a night, plus food. What do you mm -hmm. want, babes? Hold on one second. Come on. Come on. No, those costs can add up very quickly, and I've done the GDC experience with devs on a budget, and you know you can minimize those things as much as you can. You can take the Amtrak there instead of flying. You can you know double, triple, quadruple up on a hotel room and you yeah. know couch surf and split costs that way. You can... Uh, you know, skip the Uber, skip the lifts, and walk everywhere. You can eat at Subway every day. You know, there's ways that you can trim the budget on things, but it still is a big expense. Now, I'll I'll maintain. Um, it's an industry conference. This is a professional event, so this sure. is arguably one of the best investments you can make in yourself because a couple thousand dollars or a couple hundred dollars here or there it might get you that interview, get you that connection, get you that exposure, mentorship, or education to make it in this business. Folks come home from conventions like GDC uh, with their lives completely changed sometimes. Do you think uh, Do you think that's as applicable 
today. I feel like it's really, and again, this is just my experience recently. It feels like it's harder and harder to make those meaningful connections. There's fewer mm -hmm. parties now. There's fewer mixers at GDC. So a big way of, there's still plenty of sessions. You can go and learn. Don't get me wrong. We got, we got mm -hmm. tons of uh, sessions and stuff happening. But someone like me, uh, and maybe I'm not the best or most appropriate audience, I generally, like when I go to PAX, when I go to GDC, um, I don't go to the sessions. I'm not attending the talks. I am trying to network and meet people. I'm trying to do lunches and dinners. And it seems over the past few years, you know, I remember old GDC or older, uh, I mean, Unity would have parties, PlayStation would have parties, like you'd find, you know, there'd be like a big IGN thing sometimes. You'd find ways to be able to get into places where you could start talking to people and network. Those kind of extracurricular events are becoming fewer and farther between. So it's almost like if you don't have a network going into it, um, it becomes a lot more challenging to build that network out. Um, and maybe there's some steps, there's definitely steps you can take before that, but that's just kind of the the impression I've been getting. Um, and the reason I, I sort of think about this is because I, I, I plan GDEX around these thoughts, these, these crazy mm -hmm. thoughts I have in my brain. And so one of the things is like, well, I think you can, you can make the, you can smooth out the path, we'll say a little bit by the fact that GDEX is just a much more affordable show. You know, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to sell GDEX here. I'm just a little behind the curtains conversation, right? So if you can, if you come to GDEX and you get our hotel block and you stay for the entire weekend, let's say you show up on Thursday and you stay through Sunday, hotels are going to cost you, um, let's say, $700 after taxes. Uh, there's plenty of food options right around the convention center that are very affordable. Um, and the show itself, our most expensive badge is like a, after tax, like $185 or something. Mm -hmm. So that seems, I think that like allows people to kind of, you can buffer out your experience a little bit when you're paying, let's say a thousand dollars as opposed to $8,000. And that's sort of all in, I'm saying like that, you know, you can Airbnb stuff in Columbus. You can find places in Columbus that will be, 50 bucks a night or whatever, if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, so I it's guess definitely a lower barrier for entry. And I think that that's encouraging for, for students and for the folks that are just, you know, breaking into the industry because conventions and the, the whole convention circuit is a, is a very big business expense, whatever level you're doing it at. And I remember, you know, my first GDCs, I was doing them very much on a budget. I was always getting the most inexpensive badges and, you know, trying to get as many experiences as I could afford at the time. And the more years that I went to GDC, the more I kind of revised my strategy for figuring out what kind of interactions I had to have uh, or that I wanted to have. Because I remember there were years where <clears throat> I had I had friends, I had colleagues who, when they went to GDC, they were all about panels. They wanted to go to talks because they felt they were there to learn uh, from industry professionals. And that was the, the greatest value of the convention for them was always the panel talks. Totally. I had other folks who really loved going on the show floor, interacting with other devs, seeing games, seeing products, seeing things for sale. And that was what they enjoyed the most. And then there was always a contingent of people who went to a major convention like GDC and didn't even get a badge. They were all about after parties and hanging out at the hotel bar and meeting people organically there. Just being in the same city around all these things happening and getting a lot of uh, interactions without ever having to step foot on the show floor. And the more that I would go to conventions like GDC or PAX or E3, uh, that turned out to be just as valuable for me. Because most of the conversations I had, if the show floor or a panel talk was the point of entry where I might make first connection with someone, the conversation always happened back at the hotel bar, back at the after party, somewhere totally, else. Totally. So I would just start my conversation there. And the last time I did GDC, I, I think proportionally I spent the least time that I've ever spent on the show floor and more of it exploring the city, uh, going, to, going to Alcatraz, for example, or going to... Uh, 
you know, different places around San Francisco to, to get away from the show floor. And that was what was valuable for me. But I think it's different for everybody. I mean, depending who you talk to this year about, you know, what's the impact of GDC or other conventions. I can always, every year, I'll talk to one person who will be the prettiest girl at the dance. And they'll say to me, like, Ross, I had, you know, four job offers yesterday. And I'm like, that's fantastic. I'm glad you're getting the most out of GDC. And then I'll talk to someone else who spent the entire week hustling and having coffee talk and say, you know, not I couldn't find one job here. You know, this convention's a lie. And it it just depends what your skill set is and how how demand you uh, you are in, uh, you know. Well, that's and a, then th- this year especially, I think with you know we've been talking about industry layoffs for the last couple sessions here. I think this GDC is going to be uh, even more aggressive. Maybe we've turned on the Final Fantasy difficulty mode here uh, mm-hmm. for networking and professional well, that's you know what, collaborations. That's what I'm wondering is like there's, there just seems to be less job hunting kind of stuff at GDC. And I think a lot of the people mm-hmm. that are doing hiring and stuff, they're not going to GDC to find employees. Um, I think they're going more to connect with others and, and have that industry network thing. Um, could be wrong. That's just the impression that I get. I don't see a lot of um, speed dating, job finding things anymore. I don't see a lot of connecting with publisher things anymore. Um and and maybe that's just a, a change of the times, but uh, all right, you ready? To continue on. So let's do it. All right. So next up, uh, we don't need to talk about this very much because it's just been an ongoing thing. <laughs> I love your enthusiasm. Yeah, this is an article. This is on Variety uh, and uh, Jennifer Moss. Uh, EA to lay off more than 600 employees or five percent of its workforce and scrap Star Wars first person shooter game. Uh, hmm. more layoffs, more layoffs. It's, it keeps happening. It is the season. Um, I, I, I like to say lately, don't send prayers, send pizza. Uh, so send a pizza to your favorite dev right now. It's not a good time for, for this business. Yeah. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, you know, folks in this industry bounce and land on their feet. So that is not going to make anyone feel better that I say that, but I, I hope that it's true. And I hope that this is an opportunity for folks to find something that fits them a little better. I know I've had a lot of preliminary calls with new clients over the last couple of weeks of folks who have just left uh, a major studio or left somewhere where they've been the last couple of years. And they're excited to start a new venture, excited to start something fresh. And sometimes that means calling a, a lawyer, an accountant, or another professional. So I'm, I'm hoping people are trying to make some lemonade out of this very lemony situation. Sure. Well, along those lines, I thought this was cool. Uh, we're not going to talk about it because it's a video, um, but people uh, on our Sandbox Weekly email can check it out. But um, on CNN, uh, there is uh, Africa's billion dollar gaming business. Um, so there's a pretty cool video um, focusing, I think, on Kenyan, uh, but looking at um, games development and gamers in the lovely continent of Africa, which is one we don't typically hear a lot about when we talk about games development. I think, obviously, uh, the US, Europe, and Japan are the big ones, but you also hear a lot about. Uh, you know, Southeast Asia, India, and whatnot. But uh, I thought this was pretty cool. So it's a video I'd recommend checking out. Um, you know, different parts of the world are starting to pop up in that space and and begin to, um, I hope, make some really cool content. I'm, I'm curious to see, uh, you know, w- what will be the first maybe big game that comes out of Africa that people are talking about. You know, like, um, I'm trying to think, you know, Papers, Please uh, was out of, uh, oh, I'm totally blanking now on, um, it wasn't Poland, was it? No. Oh my God. But anyway, I'm totally blanking. Uh, but just seeing every so often, um, an interesting game pops up from somewhere around the world that people really grew on. Um, and we, we've seen a lot of stuff, I think in Eastern Europe lately too, which has been kind of neat, sort of more Soviet block ish, uh, as relevant as that term may or may not be nowadays. But, um, but yeah, I thought that was cool. Uh, That's very cool. I, I'm always excited to see games being used for accessibility, and uh, I, I love seeing games out of unexpected or, or unusual places, and that is a, a huge market uh, where I, I hope to see some new diverse stories coming from. Okay. You want to get legal? Uh-oh. Let's do it. All right. So next article on our topic today... Class action lawsuit against unfair PlayStation store prices is allowed to proceed. This is mm-hmm. on uh, Twisted Voxel, 
uh, was it Muhammad Ali Bari? Okay, is the author of this uh, class action lawsuit against unfair PlayStation Store prices has been granted in the court's le uh, legal order to proceed. The lawsuit in question uh, was filed in the UK back in November of 23. As per the lawsuit, Sony Interactive abused its dominant position by requiring digital games and add-ons to be bought and sold only via PlayStation Store at unfair prices, which charges a 30% commission on developers and publishers. Uh, since then, the lawsuit has received permission to uh, proceed with the collective proceedings order, blah, blah, blah. Um, also of note, uh, Apple got pinged. Um, so it sounds like this is... I'm just going to throw this out there, and and I could be totally wrong on this since I'm not... Uh, I uh, didn't dig into this as much as I should have before jumping on and spreading lies and propaganda. But it sounds like uh, that this is because Apple got pinged with one, too, that a bunch of lawyers got together and uh, jumped on the new uh, EU ruling regarding um, having uh, to offer multiple stores in um in the platforms so apple you know has to allow like epic to have its own store so these platforms cannot be the only store uh that is offering these these contents so it sounds like maybe the deadline passed on that and playstation and apple and a few others weren't as quick on the draws they should have been and now everybody's jumping in to sue them so i'm curious your thoughts as the man who is uh the only one barred i'm barred from a the few only things, one but the only one way. barred um, why, why we got to pick on us poor lawyers? I don't think that <laughs> I don't think there was a boardroom of uh, lawyers out there twirling their mustaches, plotting an evil takeover. I don't think so, but this, lawsuits. but it sounds like this is a pretty large class action, which probably involves some contingent of firms and or lawyers working. I think there's ninety thousand. Yeah, there's ninety people 000. in it. Well, I mean, it's just a large consumer class. Uh, yeah. I mean, class action lawsuits are about consumer protection. It's all about uh, enough people out there all were similarly damaged, similarly hurt, uh, somehow all encountered the same problem and are trying to combine all of their claims to find some solution that kind of fits everybody. And in this situation, uh, you know, you, you can agree or disagree, but I, I think the notion behind it is a, a free open marketplace is one with multiple storefronts, is one where people have the option to buy their content where they want it uh, at a price that's competitive. And I think uh, th that's what's in the best interest for consumers and, and gamers broadly. That means they're going to get the best quality content at the most competitive price. So the more storefronts, the better for gamers. Not necessarily the best option for platforms uh, who are looking for exclusivity or you know making the the best buck they can off the same content third party or otherwise so i'm interested to see how this is going to trickle down into other marketplaces because i know there's similar things out there kind of brewing against valve uh, mm -hmm. you know and then stateside as well so i'm interested to see what's going to happen but i hope it's going to work out in the favor of consumers i, I want to see gamers uh you know, getting the best access to good content uh, at good prices. So hopefully that's something that this is aimed to that's, accomplish. That sounds great. I do not think that's going to happen. Uh-oh, why not? Hot I take. will push back because I think there's this idea of competition, which is sort of the basis of a lot of stuff, which is great, which is if you have competition, then you have a bunch of people um, ideally fighting against each other to provide the best value for... Uh, consumers, and then we all kind of benefit from that. And there are certain situations where that happens. So I think Games Pass, uh, I'm one of those people that firmly believes Games Pass would not exist if we didn't have the competitive marketplace the way that we currently have it. And the fact that Xbox is quote unquote losing the console war, which I think is a little hyper hyperbolic, but I think that's why Microsoft decided to create Games Pass to begin with, um, to become more competitive against Sony, which then forced Sony to create their PlayStation Plus and, and, and redo that, revamp that to make it better for consumers. So I think that's an example of where it works. However, I think time and time again, it has been shown that simply adding more options to a situation does not improve quality. And I think we see that, for example, in streaming services now. The streaming services world is a hot mess of bullshit where now everything is hidden behind layers of obfuscated 
exclusivity. And I don't think we're going to end up in a world where prices come down. I mean, we didn't see that with digital, right? There's absolutely no reason that digital downloads should cost the same amount of money as physical. If you're just going with straight economics 101, Adam Smith, Wealth of the Nations, kind of free market capitalism. Uh, an efficiency was entered into the system with digital distribution that should have been reflected in pricing. It was not because everybody in the industry realized, well, I can just keep charging you the same thing and you're going to pay it so I can increase my profit margin without changing it. And they also didn't want to piss off big box retailers at the time. So I get that. However, where we are now is, uh, so let me say, I'll say my piece here and you can tell me if I'm wrong or not. I'm going to go back to a little, little known man by the name of Steve Jobs. And when he first released, if you remember, when they first released the iPhone in 2007, on my birthday, June 29th, 2007, uh, there was an uproar because the iPhone couldn't play Flash. And that was like Adobe Flash was all over the internet and everybody was like losing their minds that like, you know, how can you call this phone the real internet if it doesn't use Flash? And Steve Jobs' response was like, 95% of the stuff out there in Flash is just ads and nonsense stuff that slows down your browser, it interrupts your consumer experience, it doesn't add any value to you. And so no, we are not going to include Adobe Flash. It is a, it had a memory leak that was pretty massive, it's, a, it's an old technology, we're not going to do it. And uh, of, I think that more or less Steve Jobs was right on that. Fast forward to now. Look at every website, including every website that I've picked up here. Let's just for fun. Burp. This is the twisted voxel. We start here at the top. Add, 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 add. Uh, more ads, social media, more ads, social media, and then a bunch more sponsored content. I think that we are going to end up in a position where we just have a bunch of stores that are trying to sell you stuff. And when you're going to be like, oh, I want to play this game. You're like, oh, oh awesome. I'm going to go on the a Apple App Store. Oh, it turns out it's only on the Epic App Store. It's like, okay, well, now I got to download the Epic App Store. I got to make an account on that. I have to buy the game through Epic. I, th I think it's going to become a disjointed mess. Um, and I say that not as somebody, uh, even though I am an Apple fanboy, but not as somebody that needs Apple to take over the world. But... The Apple App Store, despite its flaws, I think is the best functioning digital distribution platform in the world. It's easy to navigate. Uh, it's easy to uh, make purchases on. Um, I think there's been like two apps in the entire history of the App Store that have needed emergency shutdown um, as opposed to the Google Store or Steam in some cases. Um, I just think it's going to make the, the customer experience on the platform far worse. And rant to the lawyer. Go. <laughs> to the lawyer, go. Um, no, I, I loved your point about digital distribution. Of course, you know, the, the folks behind digital distribution would say that that has its own costs. I mean, we might be saving money it on does. packaging, manufacturing, and shipping, yeah, but it ain't the same as it, it is going to come. It's going to come with its own costs. We have to host more servers. We have to handle more updates. Show me, more show me a service. fucking server yeah. in this world that costs as much as. Printing a disc, printing a manual, making a box, packing the box, shipping the box, sending the box through customs, shipping the box again overseas, sending it to a warehouse, and then sending it to a store. There is no server in the world unless you're running on, like, I don't know, OUYA servers or something. We're Stadia at these days, I guess. Oh, that that was a <laughs> reference for the kids out there. Yeah. Uh, OUYA. Um, we'll see. We'll see. we'll see. I don't know. My my, well, <laughs> it it could happen. So you're you're just daring. I'm also the become, I'm also create a supply chain for you. Um, oh, sir. We'll see. Um, I'm in. I I am more optimistic about this than you might be. I my hope with a class action lawsuit like this, I think you know practically what's going to happen. I don't think it's going to result in a sweeping change that's going to completely innovate, uh, reset, reboot the way that our you know, interfaces work and the way that we have set up our business models. But probably what it's going to mean is that PlayStation Plus subscribers are going to get, you know, a five or $10 payout uh, from the class action. And it might 
dial back or slow some policy implementations. Uh, you know, we might get to see some discounts on some games for a while. We might get to see some things uh, stay in the store longer at a certain price. I don't know how long it's going to be that way, but I, could it hurt? Is it going to hurt, Chris? I it might. I, I, one of my favorite one of my favorite uh, sentences ever is uh, I, I think I, I think it was from um, there's a book called um, oh where is it where is it got uh, I think I've got it over there it's called the paradox of choice uh, it's a really interesting um, the ethos of the book is that competition is good but there is a point where having excess competition is actually a hindrance to you and having excess choice is a hindrance to the consumer. Um, so one of the examples he uses, where do you want to go, babe? Uh, is baby girl. Uh, she's awesome. And there should be a billion of her, but, um, he uses jeans and he talks about, uh, like just blue jeans in the seventies, um, where you had very little options. You would go in, there might be two or three different styles. And then of that you had your sizes, right? And that was about it. And you went and you bought your jeans and you took them home and, you know, you generally felt all, if they fit, you felt all right about them. Now there's a bazillion different types of styles and cuts and colors and brands. And when you're in the store, you're just constantly trying to, like, navigate which one you want. And then ultimately you end up making a decision, you get it home, and you're never satisfied. And he backs this all up with research. This just isn't him talking. And he, he his hypothesis is that because we have so many choices, we get into this mindset that what we purchase should be perfect for us. And there is no product that is perfect for us. And we end up in this sort of mental hellscape where we're just never able to kind of buy the thing in a way that makes us feel satisfied. Um, now that's slightly different than what we're talking about here with the stores. My thing is I just uh, you don't see this as much, but like you remember like 10 years ago when it's like every time a game came out, there was like the Target version and the Best Buy version and the Amazon exclusive version. And it's like you literally couldn't get the full game depending on what store you bought it from, mm -hmm. you know, and I was like, what is this bullshit? Like, I'm even like. Even when I bought Final Fantasy VII, which I was talking about, I bought Final Fantasy VII Rebirth when I came home drunk the other night. And the first thing it's showing me is like, there's like four different, you know, versions, the exclusive version and the deluxe version. And there's like an Amazon version that gives, sends you a, a skin for your PS5 controller. And I'm just like, what is this? So I bought the cheapest version because I, I pretty much, again, I was a little drunk. So maybe I was a little ornery. And I was just like, fuck you. Like, s just give me the game. Like, why do I have to buy all this extra stuff? You don't like, have to buy anything. They gave you the game six different ways, Chris. That's and the you're point. still mad. You don't have to, but there is there is content. I mean, we can talk about this. One of the other issues I have too is like when you buy things that are like you get the experience charm, which doubles your experience or whatever. And I was like, didn't you balance the game around a certain experience per enemy? You know, like. So now you get this add-on that you paid extra for that breaks the balance of the game. But that's a whole other thing. I could rant about that. Um, I just I just don't see... I don't think cable and streaming has shown us that more choices is better. I don't think a lot of these online stores have shown us that more cho choices is better. Um, I don't think the internet in general has shown us that more choices is better. Um, so we'll see. Maybe uh, maybe you're right, and we're going to... We're gonna, jump into a world where uh prices start to come down and like fuck that no i was i was gonna give you a little credit and say maybe you're right no no there's no fucking way adding extra stores to these mobile devices or to the playstation is gonna lower the prices one bit well it's gonna be 70 dollars, and you're gonna like it oh really um <laughs> oh no so so cynical on this on this rainy morning sir things might work out who knows they might they might. Mm -hmm. Let's just have one console to rule them all, and, and we'll subsidize it by the government so everything's cheap. Yeah, because that's how that works. All right. Well, let's let's, let's move on. <laughs> uh, I would like I would like to believe. I would like to believe. It's just I don't. I haven't seen it, but here we go. Speaking of cynical, boom. Uh, 
Nintendo Switch emulator Yuzu will utterly fold and have to pay Nintendo $2.4 million to settle this womp lawsuit. Womp. So this is on The Verge womp womp. Uh, by Sean Hollister. So I don't know. Do you know what the Yuzu emulator is? Have you heard of that? What happened here? I, I have heard of Yuzu. So this was this was largely about Zelda. Uh, it always comes back to Zelda. So uh, emulators are hard. Uh there are so many legitimate reasons to use emulators to, you know, be testing your own software, to be playing software that's not available anymore, that doesn't exist and from from a quote unquote legitimate marketplace or source. And then of course there's just good old fashioned piracy, which everybody loves. So this was one where instead of going after end users who were using this software, uh you know, to play games that they didn't pay for or to play them differently on different platforms. Nintendo went after the platform itself. They went after the emulator because it was circumventing their uh, proprietary software, I believe. Uh, you know, it was it was work it, it had workarounds in it to get around security measures that they had. So mm, okay. they're going to be shutting down Yuzu's uh, paying out. And it's not just Nintendo. I know everybody likes to pick on Nintendo as you know the one company that enforces its IP rights. They they all do. This this is not exclusive. It's just news sure. when Nintendo does it. Well, so. we did. Yeah, there's there, there's a lot going on here. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, well, first of all, I think well, we talked about this with my students. I think it is important that, um, and you could probably f um, add more context to this than than I can, but. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that in general, depending on where you are located, um, enforcing your IP, your trademarks, your copyrights, whatever, um, is a part of the protection. And a lot of times a case can be made that if you don't enforce your whatever it is, you know, your, your intellectual property, that um, it makes it easier for others to begin to use it, not just from the, hey, I'm gonna sue you for it, but they can make a claim that like, hey, for the past 10 years, you have not enforced your IP in this way. Why are you choosing to do it now? It's, it's you know, you've been doing it for a decade. It's obvious that you were okay with, you know, fair use or community use or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but legally, uh, you are required to actually, you know, you can't just have a trademark and then walk off into the sunset and you're never heard from again. You do have to, like, enforce your own trademarks and copyrights, correct? It's a situation where if you don't use it, you lose it. You do need to enforce your copyrights, not just from a, a legal perspective, but also from a branding optics perspective. Sure, sure. If there's confusion in the marketplace as to where things are coming from, if you have competitors out there using your brands or using your IP, uh, th that's going to confuse consumers. That's going to weaken your brands. So in the case of trademarks, you know, a trademark doesn't act as a good origin of goods and services if you let everybody else in the world use it. it. It ceases to have purpose. But in this case, you know, we're talking about copyright. We're talking about uh, folks who put together an emulator and made it possible to distribute Nintendo's IP and play Nintendo's IP on hardware that was not Nintendo made. And obviously Nintendo has a very legitimate business interest in protecting how their content gets sold, how it gets distributed, where it's played, and in what context. So they dropped the bomb on, on Yuzu here, and I'm, I'm not upset about it. I, I think when it comes to... So they're, they're, they're quote real fast, and then jump in. It says, mm -hmm. the emulator was sued for facilitating piracy at a colossal scale. Mm-hmm. And in in something like this, uh, you can check out the opinion to see how many copies were distributed. Uh, you know, so how many folks were playing a game like Zelda Breath of the Wild illegitimately? And the the math they always try to show is, I see this in, in lawsuits like this all the time, is, you know, this many copies of our game were distributed. This many copies of our game were, were played for free, and that amounts to this much lost revenue. You know, we could have made this many millions of dollars if people bought our stuff legitimately, yeah. if it was, if this piracy wasn't facilitated. And I've always found those arguments a little bit unpersuasive, because when it comes to piracy, that. I don't think those are true lost sales. I think the folks who are pirating things were probably never going to buy that content. It's not that... Yuzu was so popular and so easy to use and so ubiquitous that people were like, well, I could walk into my local GameStop and get a copy of Breath of the Wild or download it on the Switch that I already own. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to get it for free because it's so easy, you know, right over here on Yuzu. I think that was folks 
like specifically targeting a way to get something for free that they weren't going to buy anyway, that they weren't going to get through legitimate channels. So I don't think it's a true indicator of lost sales. I think those were sales you were never going to have. They just happened to take advantage of piracy. And I think that's the same, whether it's music on Napster, uh, you know, from 25 years ago, or whether that's pirating movies via torrent sites. Sure. I think you're not losing actual sales. I think you're losing sales. You just now know how many sales out there uh, you were never going to get. And I think, uh, you know, you mentioned Wealth of Nations. I, I think that piracy is a part of the invisible hand. I think that that's the market pushing back against distribution models or costs and trying to level a field of competition. If there are people out there who are never going to buy a Switch and we're never going to buy Breath of the Wild at a certain price point, we know how many of them there are by how many people were playing it for free on this emulator site. So that's... Mm -hmm you know, marketable information that Nintendo can use and say, oh, if this many people aren't going to play it at this price point, maybe they would play it and pay it at a different price point or at a different model or somewhere else. So it's it's interesting information, but I don't think it's a one-to-one -one ratio of lost sales. Sure. Yeah. And Tom mentions that it's also, um, piracy can also be seen in some instances as like a marketing thing where it's, it's getting out there, more people are talking about it, which theoretically mm -hmm. might spur sales or something yeah you, you mentioned music i think uh music's really interesting because they were sort of the first into the breach uh when this digital distribution and piracy uh you mentioned napster which i don't even know if most kids even know what a napster is uh, that was days. just for you chris that was just yeah. for you napster and limewire oh i remember those those days in my dorm room grabbing everything well, you could get kazaa light um but yeah I, I i agree and that was one of the things that was pushed back napster pushed to that uh, heavily when the because the music industry came in and you're like here's the download numbers and here's the amount of money we lost and it was just like a one to one conversion and then Appster was like you got to be kidding us like these people aren't gonna buy just because they're downloading it does not mean they're gonna buy it like you are heavily inflating the amount of money that you've lost on this um, and I think the courts sort of sided with Napster in that case where. Uh, I, Napster still lost, don't get me wrong, but uh, the courts did agree that it was not a one-to-one -one conversion. Um, for well, it. and I think what it was largely about, obviously people wanted free music, but I think people wanted singles. I think people didn't want to have to buy a whole album, and there was not a model in the 90s for people to buy singles often. Sure, it, was yeah. a, it was an album on a CD or a cassette. Uh, you know, yeah, vinyl kind of disappeared that, for a little while before it came back, and that was the thing. So then with iTunes, you know, we got the model back of getting... 99 cent songs so that just was good information that like oh there's a market of people who only want singles they don't want full albums if you don't make it available to them they're going to find a way to get it somewhere else sure yeah the art of the album is definitely a, a thing of the past um but that's why on my music club where I, I post a new album every week um i have not posted one this week i need to get on that but uh i i choose an entire album instead of just a couple songs, I'm like, let's listen to this album. I might get to that album because of a song, um, but I'm trying to find those like little gems you don't hear about because they're not the viral single or whatever. Um, it's all about those B-sides. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do find this. Uh, I find this interesting because uh, you, you hit on this at the very beginning of our talk here, but we didn't go into it. But game preservation is a big thing, and it's... Um, almost an impossible feat, I think, because we're so interconnected to technology that the ability to preserve games, maintain them, keep them playable, uh, is it's really impossible. You're just going to have technologies that fade in and out that you'll never have again. Um, we're starting to see a lot of remakes and stuff, um, which is great. That allows, you know, people to come back and play Resident Evil 4, right? But like, Resident Evil 4 remake is not Resident Evil 4. As much as it grabs the skeleton and the soul of Resident Evil 4, you know, those games are gone, you know? Maybe Resident Evil 4 might not be the best example because that's still kind of alive and kicking. But there's a lot of games from the 80s and 90s where no one's got the source code anymore. Nobody even knows who owns the game, you know? Like, there's been mergers and sell-offs and acquisitions, and somewhere along the line, they're just like, I don't even know who owns this property. You know, we had this one. Well, and it's only going to get exacerbated as we 
keep uh, going down this path of digital distribution because at the very least, you know, from the 80s and 90s, we had games on some physical medium for the most part. We had it on a cassette, we had it on a cartridge, we had yeah. it on a CD-ROM. So those games exist and can be preserved. But for things that were distributed entirely digitally, uh, they're going to disappear and we might lose them. So that's one of the biggest... And what uh, even is? Like, what even is the game? A game that is distributed mm -hmm. digitally. Like, look at No Man's Sky, right? As an example... There is no version of No Man's Sky that was released, the release version. I like. I'm sure they have the source code for it, and they could jump back if they wanted to. But everybody that's playing No Man's Sky, everybody hyperbolically, is playing at least some variant of the update of it. You know, mm -hmm. because it's just digital distribution. It's been patched. It's been, you know, software as a service over the years. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you, you. I think you can ask yourself like. What is the true version of cyberpunk? What is the true version of whatever? Uh, yeah. And that's not even counting like smaller indie games. It, it's it's really strange what, you know, you could, I think you could, you can more easily create a definitive album or a definitive movie. You know, here's the director's cut of the movie. And this is the what this is the movie. Changes. I, I saw this this morning where we're talking about streaming services, uh, Someone had posed the question, what movie has the best soundtrack? And someone oh. posited, L Lilo and Stitch is a movie that the, this person loved uh, for the soundtrack. And they said, but don't watch it on Disney Plus because they've pulled all the Elvis uh, out of it because of streaming rights. Mm. So something with digital services is movies can be updated. They can be tweaked uh, for rights. And in and sometimes you lose that original best version. Yeah. For, for my pet franchise, Sonic the Hedgehog, if you play Sonic 3 and Knuckles, a lot of the original tracks that were included on the Genesis cartridge are not included in uh, the newer iterations of those games. If you're playing, you know, Sonic Mega, I think they're still included on the PS2 era Sonic Mega Collection Plus, but if you're playing the new Sonic Origins Collection, uh, you know, it's got a beautiful remaster for, you know, current uh, gen consoles, but it doesn't replicate the original music in a lot of places. And that's something a lot of fans miss. They're like, where's my tracks for Ice Cap? And. You know, those things are lost uh, unless they're renegotiated or put back in. It's kind of sad. Yeah. Well, I, I even think too. Uh, jump back a minute here. Um, you're like, well, if the game's on disc, you can preserve it, but you can only preserve it as long as the technology exists to actually play the thing, right? And they're not making new Atari 2600s. They're not making new Coleco Visions. Yeah, I've got the Coleco Master thing here that has everything in there. But at some point, like you have to, you have to keep maintaining these computers. Like PCs, for example, you remember the the old days? Like a lot of the PC games, um, they would run at the clock speed of the computer, and mm -hmm. then you'd you'd put them on like a new computer, and they'd run like so fast they were unplayable because they didn't actually they didn't work on any kind of internal cycle or governor. It just as fast as the computer works is how fast the game would play, uh, mm -hmm. and you put it on i mean they wouldn't even play on today's computers but um you eventually just get to a point where like you just don't have the tech to even play the game anymore and yeah there will there'll be people that are collectors or whatever but um as the years go by i've still got my super nintendo but what am i 42 give it another 40 years how many functioning super nes's are there going to be in the world and we're we're getting to that point i know i've had to service a lot of my collection uh, because things are getting a little bit older, they don't run quite as well. I lost my my Game Gear died on me a couple months ago, and I had to recap oh. uh, the motherboard on it. I had to pull the thing apart and put new capacitors in it. So I I brought it back to life, but not all consoles live that way. You know, they're not engineered to live forever. So yeah. we might get to a point where we start losing a lot of these things, and if they don't get re releases, you know, those games are lost to time. A, f a game franchise that I really loved. I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan, so I was playing the New Line Cinema adaptations. Uh, the EA adaptations of the Lord of the Rings games, Return of the King and Two Towers. And I don't think those are ever going to see a re-release, uh, you know, post Xbox era because of just wrangling over the rights for the, the films, the books, the the latest iterations of things. Uh, so if my 360s break, <laughs> I won't be able to play those anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a wild, video games are just, they're a wild world, man. Like the things that make them super exciting and cutting edge are also the things that make it uh, hurt it and, and keep it from 
you know, what's it, like, what's our Pac-Man maybe is our citizen Kane. I, yeah. I don't know what our citizen Kane of gaming is. Um, but, uh, uh Oh, probably Pong. Yeah. Maybe. Um, if, if you're just going old school classic, yeah, but I, feel I, like I know Pong the, the comments like, will tell us what the best games yeah, are. Yeah, Pong's probably like, I don't know. I was going to say that, uh, uh, the train coming at the audience, uh, that first mm -hmm. movie of the train, but that's probably something like, you know, the MIT, uh, what was that space war or something, um, from mm -hmm. the sixties. But anyway, we're getting off track here, but, uh, I, I just, I think it's interesting. And I, I think that, um, particularly in the eighties and nineties, uh, one of the things that, again, that made the eighties and nineties amazing for video games and just media in general is that there wasn't this mindset that we have nowadays where it's like you protect every inch of your IP, no matter what, and you don't give it up for anything. Um, and I think that's because they've seen over time, um, Spider-Man is a great example where the, the, the deal Sony got on Spider-Man is just like, you will never see a deal like that again. Sony really lucked out on that one. Um, but there used to be all sorts of weird, interesting, like use of music and games and, and content and whatever, because people didn't, they just didn't view intellectual property in that way. Uh, plus a lot of nerd culture stuff just didn't make as much money. And so people didn't worry about it as much, I guess. Um, but then, yeah, nowadays it's kind of like just to get any song requires, you know, which I guess keeps you, you guys employed, but requires lawyers upon lawyers to negotiate all these, these contracts and whatever. And, um, I'm kind of curious, uh, cause there was a new Tony Hawk that came out a couple of years ago. Um, can you get the older Tony Hawks, like one, twos and threes with the original soundtracks? Or is that a thing of the past? Is that gone? I want to say that those were, those were available digitally. I think that those were on the PlayStation network. Okay. And they still maintain the same music. I don't know that they, if, if they have the same soundtrack in their newer versions, well, that's but I think I'm, those that's, were still That's out. what I'm asking is like, do, does it have yeah. the same soundtracks? Cause Tony Hawk, just like I think Guitar Hero, um, was instrumental in expanding people's music library. Uh, you know, sure. Besides the games being awesome, it was also this just this opportunity to be exposed to new music that you normally wouldn't wouldn't hear. Um, and so I'm I'm kind of curious. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I it, it's 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 interesting. Um, Going back to the, the Yuzu, I, I think that um, Nintendo is an interesting, I hate saying interesting so many times, but uh, because they also are one of those companies that I think make it harder than it needs to be to get some of their old titles, you know, like the, the, just to get some of those Super Nintendo or N64 games on the Switch um, it's better now, but you know, I think it was like, it was only two or so years ago when people were just like, are you ever going to release like the SNES store for the switch? And Nintendo's like, ah, well, we might get around to it. You know, and we're just like, well, you've got all these games. Like, why don't you just get them emulated on the switch? And then we wouldn't have to buy emulators. Um, but Nintendo's always kind of slow to the draw on a lot of this stuff. But we got it. It's here. It's one of the it's one of those things where you know just because we want it doesn't mean they have to give it to us. I believe me, I wish that they would. So, yeah. sign your petitions, join your class actions. Tom, did you like <laughs> just, justice Tom? for us? Any? Yeah, Tom, you liked my pun there. I don't think uh, I don't think Ross got it, but that's okay. My guitar I, hero, I let, guitar I hero let it stand on its own. Um, it was gorgeous. Yes, it was beautiful. Well, I I I think uh, there's lots to talk about, but we're we're starting to get. Um, uh, towards our time here. And so this, this last little thing I thought was kind of fun. We put it in here. Uh, several steam games changed names to hell divers two and Paul world to scam players. So, uh, keep an eye out, hey. out there in the, uh, in the world. If you're buying your pal worlds and your hell divers two, that you're actually buying the appropriate one, uh, which does open up the question again about platform and store control and making sure, that uh, the appropriate content is being put up on there. Um, 
So take that for what it's whatever it's worth. But I think we're getting to the the uh, end here. Um, Ross, another exciting conversation. I think. Is there anything else uh, on your mind before we wrap up? Oh, so many things. But uh, now now you're just reminding me. I have to dive back into Helldivers too. I saw we got a new patch that nerfed a few things. So I got to go check that out. Yeah, I haven't jumped on that train, but everybody is speaking very highly of it. Um, so, but I guess now I'm knee deep in uh final fantasy seven oh interestingly enough too for those who may care who are watching this either live or uh this friday um for game club the game club game of the month uh is gonna be the pedestrian uh this cool puzzle game made by a small studio skookum arts which is also a gdex regular they've been in many gdexes um and uh i am gonna have the developers on uh while i play the game this week so that will be friday one o'clock uh, PM Eastern time on my personal Twitch, which is Volpe creates. Um, so if you're interested in joining us while we play the pedestrian and with the developers, um, I think that'll be a really fun, cool experience. Uh, you know, you can ask some questions or just hang out with us. Uh, I'm looking forward to playing a game that is going to be challenging and require brains, but is not going to be like returnal, which is like balls to the wall, bullet hell, having to always be stressed kind of thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that'll be there. Um, but other than that, this has been episode 13 of the Sandbox.Space Weekly Podcast. Um, it's been an exciting conversation with our special guest, uh, Ross. Thank you for, for being here, as always. Thanks for having me, Chris. Um, I am your host, uh, Chris. Don't forget to check out thegdex.com to get your discounted GDEX tickets. Um, and follow us on the uh, social medias at the GDEX um, as we... Uh, put out new announcements for speakers and exhibitors and all that stuff um but yeah this has been episode 13 uh i'm your host chris joined as always by baby girl who again is in my lap um and we look forward to seeing you next week uh wednesdays 10 a.m on twitch.tv slash uh the gdex and then we also uh, post these videos onto our youtube which is the gdex youtube so um thank you everybody for watching and we will see you next week